Go down to verse 18. Judges chapter 16, verse 18. Judges chapter 16, verse 18. We'll put it on your screen as well. If you're there, can you say amen? amen? The word of the Lord says this. When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called the Lord of the Philistines, basically the opposite army, saying, come, come up again, for he's told me all of his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought her the money in their hands. She made him sleep on her knees. She called the man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. And she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as the other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. The Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, brought him down to Gaza, bound him with bronze shackles, and he had the ground in the mill in the prison. But the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. We're going to pause here for a moment. Out of Judges chapter 16, this very tragic moment in Samson's life, we're going to look at the second hero of the faith. And I think it's going to speak to us today. It's going to challenge us today. As uh, we're continuing in this series today, if you're taking notes, we like to take notes at Calvary. I believe they're going to check our notes in heaven. But um, today I want to talk to you from this title, The Benefit of Failure. The Benefit of Failure. Let's talk about this for the next few moments. And then we're going to sing one more time. I think worship was beautiful today. And uh, I think it is every Sunday. I say that every Sunday. But um, we're going to sing one more time and then go have an incredible rest of our day. The benefit of failure. Let's pray. And then uh, we'll talk about Samson. Father, we thank you. We love you. Thank you for your grace, your love. Thank you, God, for this house. Thank you for Calvary Church. The psalmist says, I rejoice with those who said, let us go to the house of the Lord. He said, better is one day in your house than a thousand days elsewhere. And so we're glad to be in the house. And uh, we're blessed that we're a part of the house. And so, God, we thank you. We love you. Thank you for your grace, your love. Thank you for loving people like us. We can't earn it or deserve it, but you are good and gracious. And so, God, we give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. And all of Calvary Church says... Oh, come on, all of Calvary Church says, yeah. can you make some noise for Jesus one more time? Come on. <laughs> Samson is at the most tragic moment of his life. If you don't know anything about Samson, Samson was supposed to be probably still considered the strongest man to ever live. God had graced him with supernatural strength. He had this anointing over his life. And here he is now without his eyes, and he's doing the job of an animal, of an oxen. He's tied to a mill and basically in circles till the end of his life. This is a moment of defeat. This is a moment of finality, of failure in Samson's life. He has hit rock bottom. J.K. Rowling, who became the best-selling author of a book series. She sold over 600 million copies, very well known. She looks back on her life. She was speaking at Harvard University a few years ago, and she was talking about the benefits of failure. She said that after she graduated college, about seven years later, she lost her marriage. She lost everything. She had been in a very abusive uh, marriage. They ended it. She was now divorced. She's now a single mother, she said, struggling. She had lost her job. She was broke. She said, it seemed like I had hit rock bottom. Where do you go? What do you do? You're a single mother. You got no job. You've just endured all this abuse. But she says, I thank God for rock bottom because at rock bottom, I found the solid foundation on which to build my life. Oh, hitting rock bottom has its benefits. There is benefits in failure, she said. I think many times when, when some of us, we've been there, I've been there, when, when we have faced failure in life, have you ever felt like this is the end? This is how life will finish for me? I'll, I'll never recover from this loss. 
I'm never going to be able to overcome this hard, difficult, challenging moment of my life. Maybe this is how the last days of my life will look like in failure, in defeat. Whenever we are in that moment, something in the human mind down in our, in, our, in our mind, deep down our subconscious, we try to find a reason why, and we usually look to the exterior. There has to be a reason why I'm at this point in my life. But what we fail to look is on the inside, the interior. Many times it wasn't an exterior factor, but it was actually an interior decision that caused us to end up in defeat. In fact, I put it this way, my inner me is usually my greatest enemy. I usually sabotage my own life with my bad decision making, with not listening to advice, with not listening to wise counsel, I have found myself down at the bottom of the floor realizing I didn't listen to the warning. And some of us, this is where we are today. In fact, I, I think if Samson was here today, Samson would say, hey, I was actually very blind before they took out my eyes. I think Samson would sit here with us. If we gave him a mic this morning, Samson would say, I was blind before they gouged out my eyes. And some of us can relate because how many of you know, you can still have eyes and still be blind. I put it this way. We can have sight and still be blind. You can have physical eyes. You can have physical sight, but still be blind because pride is blinding. Let's talk about blind, uh, pride for just a moment. How many of you know pride will blind us? We think we know it all. We got a handle on life. Can't nobody tell me nothing. I got it nothing with an F. Can't nobody tell me nothing. I got a handle on life. I know what I'm doing. I'm a good businessman. I'm a good businesswoman. Look at the family I've raised. Look at the corporation I, I built. But how many know all that comes from the hand of God? Oh, come on. It is God who blessed us with strength. It is God who blessed us with wisdom. But pride will blind us. All of a sudden, we don't listen to people around us. We have deaf ears to the council around us. We have no clarity when we're walking in pride. And sometimes our own decision-making leaves us at rock bottom. I think today, maybe I just have a sense in my heart, there's people here, you're, you're at the rock bottom. You are living in defeat, maybe a defeat of a, of a decision you made. Maybe your marriage is going through defeat. Your family's torn apart. Maybe in your own personal life, you feel defeated. You feel like this is how I'm going to end my life. Is this how life is always going to be like? Maybe you've been prideful. Maybe you haven't listened to wise counsel and it's led you down a path of destruction. But I think if Samson was here today, he would continue to say, don't you give up. Don't you stop because we serve a God of second chances. He's a good God. Come on, he's an awesome God. And if you call on him, he will answer. He'll deliver. He'll forgive. He'll save. I don't know about you, but I'm grateful for the God that will pick us up when we hit rock bottom. Many times God lets you hit rock bottom to realize he's the only rock on which to build our life. I'm thankful for the rock that is called Jesus. Come on. Today, I put it this way, failure is only final when we refuse to get back up. Somebody say, get up. Get up. Oh, come on. Failure is only final when we refuse to get back up. Today, are you down? Get up. Yeah. Are you defeated? Get up. Do you feel like you've lost everything? Get up. Come on, God is a good God, and he'll pick us up every single time. Is anybody a witness to his good grace, to his love? Anybody thankful that he saved you, that he picked you up, that he turned you around? Come on, he's a good God. Give him a praise this morning. Samson. Samson, what a character. What a character. We look at Samson's life. I mean, today... I think, it, I love it that the message ties with what we did. Samson was dedicated to the Lord. His parents couldn't have babies. They couldn't have children. And one day an angel shows up and he says, oh, you're, you're going to have a child. And this child is going to be dedicated to the Lord. There's a special purpose for Samson's life. And they told him he's going to be a Nazarite. What that meant is he was going to do three important decisions in his life, not to cut his hair and stay away from certain foods, not to touch any dead things. Nazarites were people who were, uh, they had a vow not to cut their hair, to be separated just for God. It's an Old Testament thing. And you, you would see a Nazarite and you're like, oh, 
He has a special purpose from God. You knew when you saw Nazarite, they had a purpose from God. Samson was one of them. And God says, I'm going to give him strength, and he's going to be super strong because he is going to defeat the Philistine army. And Samson became extremely strong. I mean, Samson was like the Hulk in real life. I mean, you looked at Samson, it was like looking at Arnold. I mean, just the same kind of strength. I mean, just a strong type of man of God. And he killed animals with his bare hands. He ripped out gates with his bare hands. I mean, I'm talking about looking at Arnold is looking at Samson. <laughs> and Samson became the strongest man to ever live. No, no, here, here's my perspective. I don't think Samson was a strong man. I really don't. I think Samson was a weak man that God made strong. Yeah. And there's a difference there because sometimes we think we need to be qualified with certain qualities for God to use us. I'm not strong enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not wise enough. I'm not holy enough. I don't have my act together. Can I tell you, the God that we serve, you don't have to get your act together. You come to him and he'll help you get your act together. You don't have to be the strongest. You come to him and he'll make you the strongest. You don't have to be the smartest, but you come to him and he'll give you wisdom which you can't imagine. Samson wasn't the strongest. He was just a weak man that was available for God to use. I don't know about you, but everything that I've accomplished in my life wasn't it because I was smart enough good enough strong enough it's because of his good hand it's because of his grace it's because of his mercy I'm thankful I don't deserve my wife I don't deserve baby Aria I don't deserve my car I don't deserve the blessings but God is a good God he's a giver of all gifts he'll bless your life he'll bless your family he'll bless the generations oh you come to him he'll put your life together come on he's a good God Oh, he'll bless your socks off if you come to him. I can't come to him. I'm all messed up and jacked up and banged up. You come to him and he'll help you. Yeah. Yeah. Samson was a weak man. He had a lot of weaknesses. One of his biggest weaknesses was pagan women or foreign women. Spanish translation, muy mujeriego. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, he's supposed to be separated to God. He had a special purpose in his life, but his eyes, he had a wandering eye. And he kept going to places he shouldn't have and messing around with people he shouldn't have. And like I said, Samson would say, I was blind before they took my eyes. What would Samson tell us today? I believe Samson would tell us, number one, he was blind to purpose. He was blind to purpose even before they took out his eyes. Somebody say purpose. Samson had a purpose since before he was born. Yet he, he came now, is born, has a physical life, and as he's growing, he doesn't realize he has a special assignment over his life. And he begins to lose sight of God's assignment over his life. He begins to wander. He begins to look across. He begins to mess around with the group of people he shouldn't be mess around with women that he shouldn't have, he, he lost his purpose. Look what the angel told his parents, Judges chapter 13, verse 5. You're going to become pregnant and have a son. You must never cut his hair because the boy will be a Nazarite dedicated to God from birth. He will begin to rescue Israel from the power of the Philistines. In other words, his purpose was to deliver the people of God from the oppressor, the Philistines that were enslaving them and killing them. What an assignment from God. But when you don't know your assignment or when you lose your focus, you start to do things you shouldn't because you've lost your direction in life. When you have a purpose, you know where you're going. When you have a vision, you know the direction of your life. When you know God has called you, you know the path. But when you lose that, the Bible says, he who has no vision casts off restraint. In other words, if you don't know your purpose, you start to do whatever you want, whenever you want, with whoever you want. Oh, I'll just do whatever in life. I don't even know what I'm here for. Many people don't know why they're here. I'm here to tell you, you have a purpose in your life. Purpose and calling is not just for pastors or people who sit in the front row. Purpose is for every single human being. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. He made you. He designed you. He picked you. He formed you. He knows you by name. That's the God that we have. You're not a mistake. You have a purpose and a plan in him. Come on, you're chosen before you were born. 
That's the God that we have. You're not a mistake. You're not an accident. Are you blind to the purpose in your own life? Are you just wandering around through life? Don't be blind to the purpose because you might end up at rock bottom. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what I'm doing. Samson would say, I was blind to purpose. Number two, I think he was blind to relationships. He would say, well, I didn't know the power in relationships. How many know relationships have power? He thought he was just here walking around earth and he could do whatever he could do. And all of a sudden, in our terms, he went across the street through a different neighborhood and he looked across and he's like, oh, these women look good. <laughs> Lord, is it from you? This could be my sugar foot, honey boo boo. <laughs> and he started messing around with women he shouldn't have. He got into relationships he shouldn't have. L listen to how blind he was. Judges chapter 14, verses 2 through 3. He went home and he told his father and mother, I've, I've seen a Philistine woman at Timnah. Oh, Timnah got some good women. Now get her for me so that I can marry her. Look at his parents. His father and his mother asked him, Aren't there any women among our relatives or all of our people? Translation, they're saying, stay in the faith. Don't, don't marry people of opposite faith or who have no faith. That's what it meant. Do you have to marry your women from those godless Philistines? And look at his response. But Samson told his father, get her for me. She's the one that I want. You're the one that I want? <laughs> I don't know why that is. <laughs> Yeah, the one that I want. Okay. <laughs> Here he is completely disobeying his parents. And, and, and come on, we can be honest. Let's put our guard down today. Let's relax. We've all done this. Yeah. Not just with a romantic relationship. Beyond that. Yeah. We haven't listened to wise counsel. Yeah. Maybe today, some of us, we got friendships in our life that are no good for our own soul. And we know, we know. Come on. Some of us, if you grew up, especially in a Hispanic home, my mom would always tell me, Dime con quien anda y te diré quien eres. Tell me who you're with and I'll tell you who you are. Anybody heard that growing up? It was like an echo in my ear. I was in school and dime con quien anda y te diré quien Jim Ron, the very famous, incredible motivational speaker, he was one of the best. He says, your life is the average of the top five friends you hang around with. There's power in relationships. Who, you, who do you hang with? Who do you talk to? What do you lend your ear to? Yeah. What are people telling you? Maybe they're, they're filling your ear with nice things. Maybe they're giving you advice that is not godly. There's power in relationships. Samson didn't listen to nobody. He was blind to the power of relationships. And I think lastly, number three, he was blind to warnings. He was blind to warnings over time. I mean, we just read a piece. We just read a few verses in Judges chapter 16. But go home. You can read about Samson's life in under 20 minutes. Judges chapter 13 through 16 is the short story of Samson's life. And you will see over time, he kept disobeying God. He didn't listen to wisdom. He did whatever he wanted. And he got into some trouble for doing his dirt. The problem is we think that we can keep getting away with stuff. Oh, Alex, but God is love. He loves me. I'm a cute human being. He's in love with me. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I just got dizzy really quick. Don't get me wrong. God is, God is in love with us, and he's a good God. He's a gracious God, but God is love, but God is holy. And the Bible says you can't play around with God. You can't mock God. You can't keep sinning and thinking that you're going to make a mockery out of him. And here you are living however you want, doing whatever you want. There are consequences to sin. You can go. The Bible says it's a principle. What you sow, you will reap. Oh, he may forgive you. He loves you. And God will pick us up. But we'll still have to face the consequences of our actions. And he was warned over and over again. We'll read one last scripture. Judges chapter 16 out of his story. It says, she got him to fall asleep with his head on her lap. How many know that's dangerous already? That's a whole nother message. Watch your head. <laughs> mm -hmm. Then she called the man and she had him shave off the seven braids. Remember the sign of his life that he was a Nazarite and where his strength came from was from his hair. It was just symbolic. She shaved off the seven braids of Samson's hair and he began to weaken. 
and his strength left him. And she called out, Samson, the Philistines are on you. She tricked him. She betrayed him. One translation says she vexed them to the point of exhaustion. Some of us, we keep playing around with sin. It will tear you down. It will weary you down. You think you're strong enough to mess around with sin. It will, it will weigh down on your soul. Yeah. And it says that, verse 21, so the Philistines captured him. They took out his eyes, gouged out his eyes, put out his eyes, and they took him down to Gaza. And there they bound him with bronze chains. And he worked in the grinding mill in the prison. Literally, they, they got him and they treated him like an animal for the rest of his life. He didn't heed the warnings. He didn't listen to what God told him. He didn't listen to his parents. He didn't listen to the dedication that was over his life. And here they grab him, they pluck out his eyes, and he does the work of an oxen for the rest of his life. The strongest man that ever lived becomes the laughing stock of the opposing enemy. They're mocking him. They're, they're laughing at him because he disobeyed the Lord. If Samson was here today, he'll say, don't be blind to purpose. Don't be blind to purpose. Know why God has called you. Amen. Don't be blind to relationships. Be careful who you entangle yourself with. Who are your life friends? Be careful. And don't be blind to the warnings of God. The Bible says to have fear of the Lord. And what does that mean? That doesn't mean to be scared of God, to say, oh my God, God is this angry God. No, it says to have reverence toward God. Yeah. Today's culture, today's day and age, we treat God with contempt. Yeah. I can do whatever I want. He's a good God. I don't care. He's good. And we go into one church one day and then we go out and do whatever we want the next day. And it's like, have the fear of God. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Listen, it takes a lifetime to build influence and it takes one bad decision to lose it. Yeah. You'll spend your whole life trying to build a family, a beautiful life, a legacy. One bad decision could ruin it. Listen, don't be blind to the warnings. Samson would tell us, I was blind. I was blind. And I think this morning, we're about to leave. We'll finish up in just a moment. But if Samson was here, we, we can relate to Samson. I've forgotten my purpose many times in life. I made poor, bad decisions. I did things I shouldn't have. I messed around with people I shouldn't have. I was blind to relationships. And I didn't listen to mother or father or friends or pastors or leaders. I, I've been down. I hit rock bottom in my life. I know what it is to lose everything. I, I didn't listen to the warnings. I, I was blind because of pride. Samson, what a story. I think if Samson was here... Right before he will leave, right? Samson will get ready to exit stage. He'll say one last thing, one last thing. I'll give you three points of advice. And I think Adam, uh, Samson would tell us this, straight to Adam. Uh, um, I think Samson would tell us these last three things. And, and we'll finish with this. I think Samson would say, hey, hey, Calvary, number one, stay close. Stay close. And church, I feel this in my, I sense it right now in my spirit. Stay close to the presence of God. Yeah. I think he would tell us the presence of God is more important than you can imagine. Yeah. Oh, stay close to the presence. Don't stray away from the presence of God. Stay close to him. Oh, live with God. Have relationship with God. Have communion with God. It's not just about going to church. You come to church on a Sunday, that's great. But Tuesday morning, Wednesday night, Thursday morning, Friday evening, Saturday, have a personal relationship with the God. Oh, you stay close to God. Don't wander too far. I think Samson would say, don't wander too far. You stay close to him. I think he'll tell us, run to him every day. Oh, you lift up your voice and you pray and you praise. It's important. It's more important than you know, I think Samson would tell us. James chapter 4, draw close to him and he will draw close to you. Oh, I think church, this is what we need to do in our life. I've been there. I've strayed away. I've been cold many times in my life. Spiritually speaking, I know I put my eyes where I shouldn't have. I listen to people I shouldn't have. Stay close, Alex. Stay close to the presence of God. And it takes personal responsibility to do that. You're not going to wake up Wednesday morning at your house and have Calvary worship team in your living room. Like, that'd be awesome. Imagine waking up and they are in your bedroom, right? 
you wake up and all you hear is Christ is my firm foundation. And you're like, oh my God, the band is here. This is awesome. Let's sing. Like, you're not going to have the team there. You're not going to be going to sleep on a Thursday evening when life has hit you and you're late on bills and you've made poor decisions. You're not going to have Pastor Phil there, Pastor Adam, Pastor Vlad and Raquel, Pastor Diana. You're not going to have any of us teaching a sermon there. You got to learn how to encourage yourself, preach to yourself, praise yourself. It takes personal responsibility to stay close to God. You got to wake up on a Tuesday morning and whether the team is there or not, say, oh, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice in it. I will bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and forget not his benefits. Early in the morning, I will worship him. With band, with no band, with worship team or no worship team, I'm going to get up and bless the Lord because he saved me, he forgave me, he redeemed me, he picked me up and put me on the rock somebody you gotta lift up a praise on the inside by yourself I'm gonna stay close you gotta get up in the morning and preach to yourself in the mirror you men of God you got the Bible says in first Thessalonians don't put out the spirits fire I'm gonna stay on this for just a second more I think some of us here today we put out the spirits fire in our personal devotion to the Lord. Personal. You know what we have in America? We have American Christianity, which is just going to church, listening for 30 minutes, and if you take too long, I'm out. That's not relationship with God. That's religion. God doesn't want religion. He wants relationship. And what we do, I've been there. Come on, I've been there. What we do is that we allow people who failed us in church or churches who did us wrong, we allow that to determine and define our relationship with God. Well, this church did me dirty and this person I don't like. And so, God, I'm not talking to you. Listen, I've been backstabbed. I've seen dirt, all of that. But I know God is good. So I'm going to wake up in the morning and I'm going to bless the Lord. I'm going to stay close to him. I got a praise on my lips. I got worship in my heart. Oh, come on. Nobody needs to tell. I'll encourage myself. Alex, stay the path. Alex, stay the course. Stay close. Come on. He's a good God. I think Samson would say, stay close. Number two, I think Samson would say, choose well. He'll say, be careful with the friendships and relationships you're in. Choose well. I've made some bad choices. I've had some friends who weren't really friends. I've involved myself with people I shouldn't have involved myself. I think we all can relate to that. Relationships are important. This is why Paul tells us in the New Testament, don't be unequally yoked. What that means is don't pair yourself up with somebody who doesn't have the same beliefs as you, values as you. What we love to do is go missionary dating. Pastor Alex, what happens is that he's fine. I know he doesn't know Jesus, but I'm going to save him. I'm going to save him. Can I tell you, it's easier for that person to pull you down than them to pull you up. We start compromising our values. We start compromising our morals. Relationships have power. Amen? Who are your close friends? Who's around you? I love what Pastor Chris Hodges says. He says these four things about relationships. He says we need to nurture important ones. We should also restore broken ones. Sever harmful ones. And then initiate meaningful ones. One more time, I think we need to nurture important ones. There are some important relationships in your life and in my life. I got some godly people around me that I need to nurture that. In other words, if you want to be, if you want to, if you want a friend, you need to be a friend. Be a friend, nurture that relationship. These are meaningful to me. They are important relationships. Number two, restore broken ones. Make a decision. I'm not going to go through life with a broken relationship, with a grudge, with unforgiveness. That's not good for the soul. Hey, even if it's for my own health, I'm going to restore broken relationships. Sever harmful ones. Which are the relationships in our life that don't benefit us, don't helpful, they're not helpful to us? I think Samson would say as well, sever those. You know, I don't need to tell you. I know the relationships in my own life that I had to cut out. We entertain conversations we shouldn't. Come on, how many times have we laughed at things we shouldn't? That we know offend God. God is holy, but we compromise all the time. And then number four, initiate meaningful ones. 
If you want somebody to mentor you, to pastor you, to help you, don't just wait for somebody to call you. Pick up your phone and call them. Text them. There needs to be some initiation. He would say, hey, choose well. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20. Walk with wise people and become wise. Befriend fools and you get in trouble. Choose well, Calvary. Hey, you want to run with horses? Who's in your life? You want to run with horses? Who's encouraging you? Who's praying for you? Who's in your life? Who, who are you accountable to? You don't need to be accountable to everybody. You don't need to tell me all your business, but have one person in your life. I got one, two, three people that I, I tell them all my business because I need help just like you. I want to run with horses. And I call, I call my therapist. I call my pastors. I'm like, hey, pray, pray for me today. I'm going to cut somebody today. <laughs> Choose well. Don't have that person in your life that says, hey, yeah, go cut them. Go cut them right now. <laughs> I think uh, if Samson... We're about to leave. He'll finish with saying, stay close, choose well. And then number three, he'll say, get up. Get up. Get up. Samson was a failure. If we just stop reading in Judges chapter 16, we'll be like, how is he a hero in the faith? He slept with multiple women that were pagan, that weren't believers. You can say he failed God. You can say he, he was an embarrassment to his parents, to his friends. To the people of God, he was supposed to be a hero. And <sighs> We get to Hebrews. You cross the Bible to the New Testament, and you get to the book of Hebrews. The writer of Hebrews is talking about faith and he gets to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 is known as the hall of faith, right? Like basketball has the hall of faith, baseball, all that. Our faith has the hall of faith, we call it. It's chapter 11 in the book of Hebrews. And you start reading Hebrews and, and the writer of Hebrews is encouraging us saying, stay the course. Look at all these men and women of God. Look at Deborah, look at Abel, and look at Moses. And he names all these incredible heroes that you and I, we would probably know and we've heard. Hebrews chapter 11, all of a sudden, verse 32, he says, and what more can I say? He's naming a bunch of heroes. And then he says, oh, I would run out of time if I told you about Gideon, if I told you about Barak, if I told you about Samson. Samson? What is Samson doing there? Why is Samson in the hall of faith? This, this makes no sense. Samson was a failure. Samson was an embarrassment. I'll call the writer of Hebrews and I'll, I'll say, I think you made a mistake. Samson failed. Samson embarrassed us. He's no hero. But I thank God that God doesn't box us in moments of our life where we make mistakes. We serve a God that doesn't box us in a season. You might have made a mistake, but that's not who you are. You might have put in the bad foot and slipped, but that doesn't define your legacy. Oh, we serve a God that heals. We serve a God that restores. We serve a God that says, get back up. Get back up. We serve a God that says, I will redeem you. I'll restore you. I'll bless you. I'll bless your family. I'll bless your children. I'll bless your generations. You're not defined by your mistakes. Let's stay standing for a moment. You're not defined by your mistakes. Calvary, listen to me. If Samson was here, he says, that is not who you are. Yeah, that does not define your generation, your legacy. Oh, Samson might have made a mistake, but at the very end of Samson's life, the Bible says he became the entertainment source for the opposing army. And the Philistines would laugh at him. And one day they bring him out to this small arena and they put him right in the middle of the arena and they're all laughing at him. He has no sight, no vision and he holds on to two pillars and the Bible says that there he remembers the Lord. At the very bottom, at rock bottom, he remembers the only rock that you can build your life on. Amen. Judges chapter 16, it says that Samson prayed to the Lord and he said, remember me and strengthen me one more time. 
One more time. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson. He pushed out the pillars. And that day he ended up destroying, killing almost 3,000 Philistines. Because you serve a God that remembers you. You serve a God that will back you up. You serve a God that will forgive you. You serve a God that defines you by his power, his strength, his grace, his mercy, his hope. We serve a good God. We serve an awesome God. The Bible says seven times a righteous man will fall. Seven times the Lord will pick him up. Come on, why don't we lift up our hands all across this place. Hallelujah. Lift up your hands all across this place in additional seating online. Every hand lifted. Come on, for a moment, let's thank God for his grace. For a moment, let's thank, come on. Is there anybody grateful in here that God didn't define you by that mistake? Why don't you lift up a praise for a moment? Anybody thankful that he didn't judge you based off that one mistake in your life? Get up. Get up. Oh, we've all made mistakes. We've all slipped. We've stumbled. We've fallen. But seven times the righteous person gets back up. Get up in Jesus' name. Get up in Jesus' name. Get up. In Jesus' name, Christ is the firm foundation. He's the rock on which we stand. I want to pray for people that today you feel like a failure, you feel like an embarrassment. Guilt and shame has surrounded you, clouded your vision. You feel like you're at rock bottom. I'm here to prophesy over your life. Failure is not final in Jesus' name. That won't define you. That won't define you, man of God. Get up. I don't know who this is for, but man of God, you get back up in Jesus' name. Man of God, you get back up in Jesus' name. I don't care what people said. You get back up. I don't care how people have judged you. You get back up in Jesus' name. Woman of God, you get back up. You get back up in Jesus' name. There's still an anointing over your life. There's still a grace over your life. The hand of God is still over your life. You call on him and he'll answer. He's called you to run with horses. Get back up. Get up in Jesus' name. Come on, if that's you, every hand lifted. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you're here. We thank you that you're the God that restores, that heals, that saves, that delivers. God, thank you that you haven't defined us by our worst moments. Thank you that you are a God of forgiveness. Thank you that you're a God of grace. Thank you that you're a God that picks us up and you set our feet upon the rock. Today we're not here because we're great or we're strong or we're intent. We're here because you're great. We're here because you're awesome. And maybe everybody walked out in our life, you'll never walk out. The Bible says you'll never leave us nor forsake us. I pray for every single person going through moments of defeat where you are sabotaging your own life in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, stop right now. This is not your end. This won't define your legacy. There's grace. There's mercy in the house today. There's forgiveness in the house of God today. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, begin to heal. Heal marriages. Heal relationships. Heal homes. Spirit of the living God, come filling us right now. Come on, somebody, lift up your voice. Tell them, fill me once again, God. Fill me once again. Right, come with on. every eye closed. Maybe you're here today. You say, Alex, I don't know. F God, I'm far from God. Maybe you say, Alex, I've made so many mistakes in my life. I've sinned. And I know I got sin in my life. And I know God must be angry or mad at me. I want to tell you, God loves you. But he doesn't want you to stay there. He's a good God who wants to heal you, forgive you, and restore you. The Bible says all of us are sinners. I'm a sinner, you're a sinner. Our sin separates us from God. But the Bible says God is so good, he sent his only son, Jesus, to come and restore that relationship. Come on, with every eye closed, every head bowed, if you're here and you say, Alex, I need forgiveness. The Bible says that Jesus came and he grabbed my sin, your sin. He went up on a cross and he paid for the sins of humanity. There on that cross, he gave up his life. He went down to a grave. He died a gruesome death. Then he was laid in a grave for three days, but after three days, he resurrected. Jesus is alive. Calvary, he's offering forgiveness today. 
church he's offering you grace today but every eye closed every head bowed nobody looking around if you need Jesus today if you say Alex I need forgiveness today today I want him to forgive me I want a relationship I want to start a relationship with God I want to leave my sin behind that I'm gonna try with all my heart I'm telling you the church is gonna be there with you the Spirit of God is gonna be there with you when every eye closed every head bowed if you're saying I need forgiveness today I want to start a relationship with God I want a clean slate every eye closed every head bowed at the count of three I want you to raise your hand I'm not gonna embarrass you I'm not gonna give you a mic every eye closed every head bowed in a moment of privacy and prayer if that's you raise your hand hold it up for just a second or two I want to see who I'm gonna pray for hold it up high enough long enough for me to see you one two three raise your hand as high as you can raise it up raise it up raise it up hands everywhere hands everywhere I see you hold it up hold it up I see you 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 awesome awesome hands everywhere additional seating online you can put your hands back down come on let's pray together I want to pray for you right now all of you raise your hand I know God is here he's gonna he's gonna do something so beautiful today is an important July 23rd is the day you were born again with eyes closed head bowed Repeat this prayer after me. In fact, the whole church, let's say it out loud. Say, Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this opportunity. Today I admit that I'm a sinner and that I need you. Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God, that you died for my sins, and on the third day, you resurrected. Come on, say, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me, save me, and heal me. From today on, I'm forgiven in Jesus name amen amen and amen come on can we can we give a big hand to every decision made today thank you Adam hey if you raise your hand today hands were raised up everywhere online we'll mail it out to you we have a free gift on the way out you're gonna see everybody waving this there's a bunch of gifts in there for you I promise you we want nothing from you but we want to give everything to you we love you and so give them your email we want to send you a letter from me and Diana pick up that gift on the way out there in the connect tent let's lift our hands let's leave singing this song out one more time father we thank you that you called us to run with horses you're for us you're with us I pray that this week we'll be blessed go before us behind us and surround us in Jesus name amen